Now, some of you may recall when the World Tomorrow program was all over the radio, uh, hundreds of channel stations. Uh, when I stood back then, I listened to it three times a day. So you see, I wasn't even working back then. <laughs> 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 By the midnight broadcast, I remember it came out of WCKY, Cincinnati. By the third time I listened to it, you know, I could lip sync it. I knew exactly what he was going to say. And I never got bored with it at all. Uh, now, do you remember how the broadcast began? Art Gilmore, you and know, I talked about Art Gilmore, but who was the announcer on the Red Skelton show, was also the announcer uh, for the Garner Ted Armstrong program. And he would say, The world tomorrow. Garner Ted Armstrong brings you the plain truth about today's world news and the prophecies of the world tomorrow. Does that ring a bell? Now, not only was the message captivating, but his voice. Uh, and I used to wonder what he looked like. And so, uh, when I finally saw his picture, he looked about like what I thought he would. He was handsome, athletic looking, intelligent looking, you know, kind of like me. And, uh, <laughs> and at the end of the broadcast, they would say, this is, they would give the mailing address if you wanted to send in for any time. Herbert W. Armstrong, Box 111, Pasadena, California. And I think the zip code was 91123. Right. See, I did, you remember it too. You, you hear it, you, I heard it so many times, it just stuck in my memory. Now, but that made me wonder, I thought, who is this Herbert W. Armstrong? If, if he's even better than Garner Ted, I mean, he must really be something. So, when I later read the elder Mr. Armstrong's writings and heard him speak, of course, I was not disappointed in him either. And I enjoyed Garner Ted's analysis of world news, but I especially liked the prophecies of the world tomorrow and the clarity with which he explained Bible doctrines. To me, those were the main attractions of the program. Now, he described his duties to be those of a watchman. And I'm not going to turn to it, but that's Ezekiel 3, Ezekiel 3.17. And that is still, the watchman is still a responsibility of the church today to speak out and to warn and not to sugarcoat any of the message. Now I'm going to turn to talk about Jeremiah because he was a watchman too. The book of Jeremiah and the book of Revelation may be the two most terrible books in the Bible. Not terribly written, but terrible in the sense of the awful events they describe. Jeremiah loudly condemned sin. He warned of the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, he was a good servant. He was faithful to the task he'd been called to do. But I think if I'd been alive then, so I'm coming up for my door, I'd have gone to the cabinet and see if I had any Prozac. <laughs> I mean, he, he just did not have anything happy to talk about. Uh, so he aroused anger and hostility. He was forced into hiding. In other words, he is on the run, and he emerges. But but after even though all of, after all of that, though he still probably emerges as the most human, uh, more of a real person than any of the prophets in the in the Old Testament. He was so real that after he gave all these prophecies, and someone came to pass that time, what did he do? He turned around and wrote another book, and he gave it the appropriate title, Lamentation which just means crying, wailing, and all that. Jerusalem had fallen, other calamities had struck, and as he looked ahead, perhaps even into our day, he could see that even more of those prophecies, those terrifying prophecies, were going to come to pass. So he felt like lamenting and like crying, and so he did. He had a good cry. And there's nothing wrong with that. Very human, and it can be therapeutic, or as Barney Fife says, therapeutic. Uh, but now because now I don't know if you know this or not because of the book of Jeremiah a new word entered the English language in 1780 I don't know why 1780 I maybe could research that and find out the word is Jeremiah take the name Jeremiah take the H off the end and put a D on you don't have to capitalize Jeremiah it can be pronounced Jeremiah or Jeremiah and, it, and uh, we'll make sure I give you the correct definition of that word. 
This is what I took out of my dictionary. A prolonged lamentation or complaint. A cautionary or angry harangue. I want to hear a harangue. I'll just put it in my words. If you give a Jeremiah, you are giving an angry, ranting speech or lecture. You may not be familiar with that word, but all of us have heard Jeremiah's. Maybe we've even delivered a few ourselves. As far as I'm concerned, the nightly newscast is a Jeremiah. Wars, terrorism, murders, perversions, natural disasters, and all of that. I'd love to see NBC or one of the networks just go ahead and call it what it is. The NBC Nightly Jeremiah with Brian Williams. And I would even classify our weekly updates as Jeremiah. Why? Because they are reporting the, the world news. If you report world news, you're, for all intents and purposes, delivering a Jeremiah. It's sort of a de facto Jeremiah. And sometimes I kind of wish John you'd say those funny stories you tell us after the Jeremiah each way. At least put a few after. Now, the more church news in our weekly updates, probably the less the Jeremiah. Why? Because church news should be more upbeat and more positive. If it's not, then we really had better examine ourselves. But now let me be fair, even I can deliver a Jeremiah. Especially after a few gloomy days, and we've had to. So you're right. I'm ready today. Got a headache, my nose is running. <laughs> Still got that hangover from that wine. <laughs> but now this, those would be my weak, uh, usually mine are weak Jeremiah's. But I want to give you a better one than that. So to illustrate what a Jeremiah really is, let me present my own Jeremiah to you. Here it goes. I told you that the title of this sermonette is The Two Memorials. Well, here's the first memorial. Last week, America commemorated the 10th anniversary of the Iraqi war. Now, was this supposed to be a happy celebration? I think not, because here's what we commemorated. 4,500 Americans killed, many thousands more wounded, many thousands more with emotional disorders, and 100,000 Iraqis killed. Cost, $2 trillion. And it's, I think I heard once it's the first war America ever fought that we didn't finance it some way when we went to fight it. They just kicked it on down the road so they could blame it on somebody else. Now, because of the Iraqi war, we took resources from the successful worthwhile war that was taking place in Afghanistan, and we moved those resources over to Iraq. Then the gains which we had made in Afghanistan were lost, and we're still suffering from that today. And we'll be lucky if we come out of both places with any kind of honor at all. And it turned Iraq from being a check and a buffer against Iran. They were, they were mortal enemies. Now they're almost allies. And all of this, and this is my Jeremiah, remember, all of this now, after we were told that our soldiers would be welcomed as liberators, that we'd have easy access to Iraqi oil, that that would pay for the war, and that a stable democratic government would, be, would replace the dictatorship there. Now, I don't have to tell you whose administration started that war, so I won't. Besides, I apparently just don't get the emotional rush from name calling that some people do. And it shouldn't really matter anyway, because the human factor in such things is secondary to a far more sinister primary factor behind all of our evil. Thus ends my Jeremiah. And thus ends the first memorial I want to talk about. And as Paul Harvey used to say, let's wash our ears out with the second memorial. <laughs> now, what is this second memorial that I'm going to talk about? Well, like the first memorial, it too has changed the course of world history. Only this second memorial has changed it for the better. And the best is yet to come. If you haven't already guessed it, this second memorial is the memorial that you and I and all God's church are keeping this week. Now notice the contrast between the first memorial, which the world chose to keep, 
And this second memorial, which you and I called out of this world, have been commanded to keep. We're commemorating death too. The death of the only perfect human being that ever lived. We're commemorating the death of a man, a perfect man, whose life is worth more than the sum total of all other lives ever. Actually, we're commemorating more than a death. We're commemorating a sacrifice. And not only, not just a sacrifice, but the perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God. We're commemorating a sacrifice which makes it possible for us to have access to God's throne, to the supreme power of the universe, and to God's Holy Spirit. We're commemorating a series of events occurring nearly 2,000 years ago which make it possible for you and me and ultimately all of humanity to enter into a conversion process which can lead to eternal life in God's own family. In John 14, 1, Christ said, Let not your heart be troubled. Now, if anybody had a reason to be troubled, it was Christ. Almost certainly, more than once he cried. He'd been labeled illegitimate. He was despised and rejected, even by family and friends. And of course, he was betrayed. And all along, he foresaw the ultimate agony he would have to endure as part of his death. And he probably felt pretty troubled about that too. And as that hour drew near and he was consumed with thoughts of what was about to happen, did his disciples understand? And were they comforting and supportive? No. They were arguing. What, they were, what were they arguing about? Politics. Who among us will be chief? Now, after asking his father if there were some other way to fulfill this master plan, Christ then said, uh, not my will, but yours be done. In other words, while his disciples were wallowing around in the politics of the moment, and then later even falling asleep, Christ was committing himself to securing a wonderful future for them and for you and me. So, let us always proclaim the plain truth about world news, no matter how unpleasant it may be. But let's not become so immersed in the ugliness of it all that we lose sight of the wonderful world tomorrow. As Christ commanded us in John 16.33, in this life we will have tribulation. But because of what we are commemorating this very week, we, of all people, should be of good cheer because we know that Christ really did overcome the world.